God also for uh, giving us the, uh, the gifts and the talents to praise Him. Amen? Amen. So the scripture reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 through 13, and Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. I will read in English. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the ruler of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were rooted before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. <laughs> ห้าถึงสิบสามวันนี้แล้วสมเอลกล่าวว่าจงประชุมคนอิสราเอลทั้งสิ้นที่เมืองเมสปาและพระเจ้าถามต่อพระเจ้าเพื่อท่านเขาทั้งหลายจึงประชุมกันที่เมสปาและตักน้ําเทออกมาถวายแด่พระเจ้าและอรหารมนนั้นและกล่าวเช่นว่าเราทั้งหลายได้กระทําบาปต่อพระเจ้าและสมเอลก็จึงก็มินิฉัยคนอิสราเอลที่เมืองเมสปาเมื่อคนฟิลิเตียได้ยินว่าคนอิสราเอลได้ประชุมกันที่เมืองมิสปาเจ้านายแห่งฟิลิเตียประยกขึ้นไปต่อสู้กับอิสราเอลและเมื่อคนอิสราเอลได้ยินเช่นนั้นเขาก็กลัวคนฟิลิเตียคนอิสราเอลร้องต่อซามูเอลว่าอย่าหยุดร้องทูลพระเยโฮวาห์พระเจ้าของเราเพื่อเราทั้งหลายเพื่อขอพระองค์ทรงช่วยให้เราพ้นจากมือของคนฟิลิเตียสมเอลก็เอาลูกแกะอ่อนที่ยังกินนมตัวหนึ่งมาถวายเป็นเครื่องเผาบูชาทั้งตัวแด่พระเจ้าและสมเอลร้องทูลต่อพระเจ้าเพื่อคนอิสราเอลพระเจ้าทรงตอบท่านขณะที่สมเอลถวายเครื่องเผาบูชานั้นคนฟิลิเตียก็เข้ามาใกล้จะสู้รบกับอิสราเอลแต่พระเจ้าทรงให้ฟ้าร้องดังยิ่งนักในวันนั้นสู้กับคนฟิลิเตียกระทําให้คนฟิลิเตียสับสนโอลมาจึงพ่ายแพ้แก่อิสราเอลคนอิสราเอลก็ออกมาออกมาออกจากมิสปาติดตามคนฟิลิเตียรักท่าฟันเขาจนไปถึงเมืองเบสคาแล้วสมเอลก็เอาก้อนหนึ่งตั้งไว้ที่ระหว่างมิสปาและเซนเรียกชื่อศิลานว่าเอเบนเอเซอร์เพราะท่านกล่าวว่าพระเจ้าทรงช่วยเราชนบัดนี้ดังนั้นคนฟิลิเตียจึงพ่ายแพ้ไม่ให้เข้ามาในดินแดนอิสราเอลอีกและพระหัตถ์แห่งพระเจ้าก็ต่อสู้คนฟิลิเตียตลอดชีวิตของซามูเอล So from Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 through 14 Sometime later God tested Abraham He said to him Abraham here I am he replied Then God said take your son your only son whom you love Isaac and go to the region of Moriah Sacrificing there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, 
he set out for the place God has told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The father, the fire and wood are here. Isaac said, But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram, caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. จากพระธรรมพนมการบทที่22ข้อที่1ถึงข้อ14 24อันวันนี้ต่อมาพระเจ้าทรงลองใจเอบราฮัมและถูกแล้วตรัสกับท่านว่าเอบราฮัมท่านพูดว่าพระเจ้าค่ะพระเจ้าตรัสว่าจงพาบุตรเจ้าคืออิสหัตบุตรคนเดียวของเจ้าบุตรคนเดียวของเจ้าผู้ที่เจ้ารักไปยังแคว้นโมริยาและถวายที่นั่นเป็นเครื่องเผาบูชาบนภูเขาลูกหนึ่งซึ่งเราจะบอกแก่เจ้าเอเบรฮามจึงลุกขึ้นแต่เช้ามืดผู้อานลาของท่านพาสคนใช้หนุ่มไปกับท่านสองคนกับอิสระของบุตรของท่านท่านตัดพื้นสำหรับเครื่องเผาบูชาเดินไปยังที่ซึ่งพระเจ้าทรงบอกแก่ท่านพอถึงวันที่สามเอบราฮัมเลยหน้าขึ้นแลเห็นที่นั่นแตกไกลเอบราฮัมจึงพูดกับคนใช้ของท่านว่าอยู่กับลานนี่เถิดเราลูกจะเดินไปที่นู่นนมัสการที่พระแล้วจะกลับมาพบเจ้าอับราฮัมเอาปืนสําหรับเครื่องเผาบูชาใส่บาอิสักบุตรชายถือไฟและมีดแล้วพ่อลูกไปด้วยกันอิสักพูดกับอับดามอับราฮัมบิดาว่าคุณพ่อแล้วท่านตอบว่าลูกเอ๋ยมีอะไรหรือลูกจึงว่านี่ไฟและปืนแต่แกะสําหรับเครื่องเผาบูชาอยู่ที่ไหนอับราฮัมตอบว่าลูกเอ๋ยพระเจ้าจะทรงจัดหาลูกแกะสําหรับพระองค์เองเป็นเครื่องเผาบูชาพอลูกทั้งสองก็เดินตามไปด้วยกันเมื่อเขาทั้งสองมาถึงที่พระเจ้าตรัสบอกเขาไว้อับราฮัมก็สร้างแท่นบูชาที่นั่นเรียงปืนเป็นระเบียบแล้วมัดอิสักบูชายวางไว้บนแท่นบูชาบนปืนแล้วอิสักแล้วอับราฮัมก็ยื่นมือจับมีดจะฆ่าบุตรชายแต่ทูลทูตของพระเจ้าเรียกเขาจากฟ้าว่าอับราฮัมอับราฮัมแล้วท่านตอบว่าพระเจ้าค่ะทูตสวรรค์ว่าอย่าแต่ต้องเด็กนั้นหรือกระทําอะไรเขาเลยเพราะวันนี้เรารู้เลยว่าเจ้ายังเกรงพระเจ้าด้วยเห็นว่าเจ้าไม่ได้หวงบุตรชายของเจ้าแต่ยอมถวายชายบุตรชายคนเดียวของเจ้าวัดให้เราอับราฮัมเหนื่อยหน้ามองดูเห็นข้างหลังท่านมีแกะตัวหนึ่งเขาของมันติดอยู่ในพุ่มไม้ทึบอับราฮัมจึงไปแกะจับแกะและตัวนั้นมาถวายเป็นเครื่องเผาบูชาแทนบุตรชายอับราฮัมจึงเรียกที่นั่นว่าเยโฮวาลีเรอย่างที่เขาพูดกันถึงทุกวันนี้ว่าจะจัดไว้บนภูเขาของพระเยโฮวาขอท่านได้รับพระพรจากการอ่านพระธรรมพระเจ้า Next is the sermon titled "Rocks and Rams to Strengthen Our Faith" by Dr. Irv Pernell. I'm very glad to be with you this morning. 
It's always a, a pleasure to be here and to share the Word of God with you. I know things are a little um, strange this morning because we had two scripture readings and they don't seem to fit together. Um, and then the, the sermon title that's perhaps weird, uh, Rocks and Rams to Strengthen Our Faith. But I hope that by, by the end of the morning you'll be able to see how these things fit together and what God is trying to show us through his word. My wife and I served in Thailand with the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, now OMF International. OMF was founded in, in 1865 by Hudson Taylor, and it was called then the China Inland Mission. The CIM's goal was to penetrate the great interior of China, placing workers in each of the provinces which up until then had never heard the gospel. And they wanted to uh, help people come to faith, to disciple them, to establish churches. And the CIM eventually grew to be the largest Protestant missionary mission in China. But with all the other missions and Christian agencies, when China went through the re revolution in 1949, 1950, they all had to leave uh, China. And then they changed the name to OMF and began working in East Asia and Southeast Asia. But let's step back in time before there was a China Inland Mission. The year was 1857 and the place was Ningpo. Ningpo was one of only six or seven coastal cities that is right on the on, on the edge of China where foreigners, business people, missionaries were allowed to live. The great interior was, was off, um, uh, off the charts for them. They could not go there. In 1857, Hudson Taylor had just resigned from his mission, the China, China Evangelization Society. The society had not been consistent in sending out support money uh, to their missionary, and they actually had gone into debt. They had been borrowing money to send to their missionary. Well, Taylor was convinced that borrowing money, going into debt to pay missionaries, was not according to the way that God wanted them um, to, to operate. So together with his fellow workers, John, and Mary Jones, Taylor decided to resign from the Chinese Evangelization Society and trust God, God only, to provide his needs. Well, this was a big step because in 1857, money from England took about five months to get to China on these sailing ships. It got to China, it got to Shanghai, where the banking offices were, and then the bank would need to figure out what the um, international uh, exchange rate was before they could disperse the money. But God had provided in advance for Hudson Taylor, because before he even thought about resigning from his mission, a friend back in England had, had put money on a ship to send to China. And by the time Hudson Taylor had decided to resign from his mission and to trust God, it was just soon after that that the money arrived from England. And so God knew what his needs were and provided in advance, even before he knew that he would have that need. Well, Hudson Taylor and John uh, Jones had a storefront preaching chapel. That is, it was right on the street, and you op it was like a, you know, a little store, and you would open the front so everybody could come in and take a look at the things you were selling. But for them, this was their preaching hall. And they invited people to come in as they walked along the street to, to come in, and then twice a day, 
they would have services where they would explain the gospel and talk to people about Christ. Well, Hudson Taylor had been helping a teacher um, regain his health. The teacher was from the rural area and he, he came into Ningpo and was not feeling well. And so Taylor, who had some medical training, was helping him to get back into health. And in return, he had the teacher make two banners. Now, the banners aren't up now, but they used to be up a couple of weeks ago. There were banners on the side of the wall. These are the, the banners that were done then were a little um, narrower. And he had this, this teacher put, make two banners and put Chinese words on each of the banners. One would be on the, on the, the right side and the other would be on the left side of, of this um, preaching area. <clears throat> Taylor, when he looked at these, would then be encouraged in his faith that God would provide for their needs. And he also could use these to explain to Chinese people what God was like and how God would meet their needs. The words on these two banners eventually became the motto of the China Inland Mission and could be found for many, many years on, in OMF offices, in their mission homes, um, in their, in their uh, the churches they established. And these words continue to challenge and bless people. They bless me as a member of this mission, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, they bless thousands of other people. Well, what were the words that were painted in big Chinese characters on these banners? The words for the first banner came from 1 Samuel 7, the scripture that was read this morning. This is not a very common passage, and very seldom do you ever hear a sermon preached on this passage. Samuel was the last, last in a long line of leaders that were called judges. We read about them in the book of Judges. And uh, as we note from Judges, um, there was a whole cycle that kept going around and around and around. That is, uh, people would start by following the Lord, and then they would, eh, no, let's, you know, we need to make sure that our fields are fertile, and so why don't we wor worship the God of fertility that the, the local people have, the Philistines or whoever. And so they would turn away from the Lord, and the Lord would then punish them by letting them be defeated in battle and ruled over and persecuted by a particular group. Uh, we see this again and again. And finally, people would come to their senses and say, oh, we need to return to our God, return to our God. And then when they, they repented like that, God would send them a judge, a leader, who would lead them in battle and get them set right again. But, it, you know, it just kept going around in a cycle. Well, Samuel is the last of these judges. And as we, we read this morning, started out that Israel had again turned away from God and were subdued by the Philistines. The people now had come to their senses and were repenting and returning to seek the Lord. Samuel assembled the people at a town of Mizpah, and led them in a return to faith in God and obedience to his command. But it was, as we read, the Philistines saw this, people were gathered together and they said, well, we can we'll just surround them and wipe them all out. So the people saw this and were terrified and cried out, asking Samuel to cry out to God for help. So our passage recounts how God responded to, prayer, to Samuel's prayers and a thunderstorm to terrify the Philistines and enabled Israel to defeat their enemies. Samuel then set up a large stone. I don't know how large, large this was. I mean, sometimes we think of stones as, as small, 
This was more like a rock, but then we think rock is really big. So it's something in between that. He set up a large stone as a marker, as a memorial, that is to keep people from forgetting. It provided a visible object to bring back to memory something that God had done. And he named it Ebenezer, Ebenezer, stone of help to commemorate the victory that God had given them. Thus far has the Lord helped us. So Ebenezer was the word that was written on the first banner that was hung in the mission chapel in Ningpo. It was a word that reminded Taylor and the Joneses of all the times and all the ways that God had been faithful and God had helped them and provided for them. Well, Ebenezer uh, may be a new word for us. Uh, whenever we think of Ebenezer, we think of the, the, the old man in Dickens' Christmas Carol who was sort of a miserable, miserly old man. Perhaps this is why in 1976, the word Ebenezer was removed from the one hymn in which it it was uh, found. This hymn is what we sang this morning. Come Thou Found. We still sing it, but in the, most of the English versions, the word Ebenezer has been taken out. Oh, who knows what this is? But this morning, that's why I had the, the special insert, and the, the folks singing in English had the, the version, the original version, which, had, which said, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy grace I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. The Thai hymn that we, we sang, the Thai version, doesn't have the word Ebenezer, but it does have the meaning of what Ebenezer um, indicates. But the hymn that we sang in both languages that is drawn right from this scripture that we read, 1 Samuel chapter 7. Thus the Chinese characters for Ebenezer were painted on the banner, hung on the right side in that storefront chapel in China, and it was a reminder to these young missionaries of God's care and a testimony to them that God had always been faithful in the past. Hudson Taylor had had numerous experiences of trusting God to supply his needs before he went to China, when he was in London, when he was studying, when he was doing some, some medical um, training before he left. He had decided that he was going to trust God and not to tell other people about his needs. He would pray to God and then God would supply in his, in his time and in the right way. And he figured that if God couldn't provide, if God can provide for me back in London like this, he can provide for me out in China. Now the words on the second banner came from the other scripture that we read, Genesis 22. This is a very familiar story that you've heard sermons about, about Abraham and Isaac and how they went along up this mountain, and that, that must have been so difficult for Abraham when his son turned to him and said, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And his father Abraham, though knowing that Isaac would probably be that sacrifice, said to him, the son, the Lord himself will provide a lamb for the offering. What this indicates this morning that is Abraham had a desperate need, but he believed that the Lord would provide for that need. For all Abraham knew, Isaac would be that sacrifice, but Abraham believed God that it was through Isaac that God's promises and God's purposes 
and God developing a, a whole nation, there would be many, many people descended from the line of Isaac. And Abraham believed that. In fact, the New Testament in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that. That God would have not allowed those promises to fail <coughs> even if Isaac died. But at the right, so he talked about the Lord will provide the sacrifice. And then when Isaac was bound and lying on the wood on the altar that Abraham had built, and Abraham stretched out his hand with the knife to, to complete this action, as you heard read, the angel said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Now I know that you fear God, that you put God first in your life, that this son whom you love does not take first place in your life. I have first place in your life. Don't hurt him. And then Abraham turns and he sees a ram caught by its horns in thick <coughs> bushes. And he takes the ram and sacrifices that. And then that place is named by Abraham. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Now Jehovah Jireh isn't in many of our um, of our versions. It is in the King James Version, and it's in the Thai Bible, but in other modern versions, it, it's not found. They simply give the Lord will provide. But the, the Hebrew word for that was, was Yehovah Yireh, or Yahweh Yireh, which we have in English as Jehovah Jireh. So Jehovah Jireh was what was painted on the other banner. Painted on the, the banner that hung on the left side of that storefront chapel. And it was a reminder to these young missionaries that in whatever challenge or test, <coughs> can you imagine a greater test than what Abraham had gone through? But whatever the challenge, whatever the test, whatever the need that these missionaries would have, that the Lord would provide for them. So they had these two banners, Ebenezer to remind them of the many times in the past that God had provided what they needed. And Jehovah Jireh, to indicate that in the present or in the future, whatever their needs might be, that God would provide. So these, th this morning we've looked at, it, you may wonder where this is all going. We've, we've seen this little chapel back in 1857 in China. And these new missionaries, trusting God alone for all that they needed. And they had this, these two banners, Ebenezer, hitherto has the Lord helped us. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. One in the past, one in the, in the future. Uh, but you might think this all happened 160 some years ago. What relevance does that have for us today? Both of these words, I believe, even in 2019, have meaning for us. They can be linked together. So let's look at perhaps an application of what this means for us today. Let the ram caught in a thicket represent, what it represent to us whatever God provides for us in a time of need. So just think about, think about how God has provided something for you in a time of need. And just think, that's a ram. That's the ram. Note that while Isaac told, Abraham told Isaac that the Lord would provide, that's not what God provided. Abraham thought it would be a lamb. God provided a ram. A lamb doesn't have any horns. The lamb wouldn't have gotten caught in the thicket. And God knew what Abraham needed, and he provided the ram. In some cases, God anticipates our needs, and he provides for us in advance. 
For instance, our salvation is, our, is the single most important provision God made for us, and it was completely his work of mercy and love. So just think of all the times that you prayed and asked God to provide finances, to help in your work, in your relationship, to give you guidance and direction, to provide peace in the midst of stress or pressure. Think of all those times. So God's provision in whatever form can be represented by the ram provided for Abraham. God provides, we give thanks, and then what? Well, that's where 1 Samuel 7 comes in. The large stone that that, first, that Samuel set up and called Ebenezer was a marker, a memorial, a visible object to bring back to memory something that God had done so it would not be forgotten. Ebenezer's then are stones to help us remember how God helped us at a particular time and a particular place. Only here, in all the Bible, in 1 Samuel 7, is a stone called Ebenezer. But the idea, the meaning can be applied much more widely. The point is that in all of these events, these times that God helped his people in a particular way are Ebenezer moments. Moments that need to be remembered so that we do not forget to praise God for his help at a particular time in our lives. It also means that when we face new challenges, we don't fall to pieces all stressed out. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, you know, pull your hair out because this has to be done. The house is going to be foreclosed. I will lose the car. Something's happened to, you know, the stock market is down. What's happening with my IRA account? And all of these other things. But if we can look back and see how God has provided in our lives. We have these memorials, these Ebenezer stones in our lives. We can now trust God, the God who provides. We can trust him in this new challenge and not just fall to pieces. We forget so easily. This is why month after month, usually on the first Sunday of the month, we gather together to eat a small piece of bread and drink a small amount of grape juice. We do this to remember the death of the Lord Jesus that brought us forgiveness of sins and new life as God's children. This simple act commemorates God's version of Genesis 22. When he provided the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, Abraham was commended. Abraham, you have not withheld your only son from me. God didn't withhold his son. He let his son die on the cross for us. That's what Genesis 22 is. It's, it's perhaps the most sacred passage in the entire Old Testament. It is at the communion table that Jehovah Jireh and Ebenezer come together. The Lord provided salvation. The Lord helped us when we could not help ourselves. So just as the ram can represent every instance of when God provided for us, so the rock or the stone can, <clears throat> can mark so that we remember what God has done. So let, let's look back at your own life. Look at all the times that God helped you. Sometimes we forget these, you know, oh, that, I don't know, that's sort of fuzzy, that's way back in the past. Think, just take the time, not just now, but to take the time to think of all the ways that God has answered your prayers 
has met your needs. And make a record of those. Those are your Ebenezer moments. We need to set up our Ebenezer stones by recording in a notebook or in a computer file all those events so that we don't forget to praise God for them and so that our children and our grandchildren can learn about the ways in which God has been prominent in our families. Otherwise, our kids forget. They don't know. They don't remember what happened to our parents, to their parents. Grandchildren, what do they know? None of my grandchildren have been, know anything about Thailand. They don't know what God has worked in, in their grandparents' lives until they see something. So God provides and we erect, he provides, and then we erect Ebenezer stones so that when the next challenge comes to our, to our faith, the next test comes, we can strengthen our faith by looking at all the Ebenezers we have filed in memory in a tangible form. So let me give you just a, a few illustrations from my life, my family's life, of what God has done. In 1970 to 74, my family and I were living in Chiang Mai. In 1972, I had a research project among the Mien people with a grant from the Ford Foundation. At the end of the pro project, Ford Foundation provided a one-way plane ticket for me to go back to America. That was their typical contract. And I thought, this is silly, because there were six people in my family. What good was this ticket for just one person? <laughs> so I just, you know, whatever. We'll leave it alone. Then in September 1972, we got word that my father in New Jersey was dying of cancer and had only a few months to live. My wife and I decided that I should go back and spend Christmas, 1972, with my parents. But how? We didn't have enough money. Ah, the plane ticket. God knew I would have this need. And he met my need in advance before I knew I would have a need. So this has to be in, in my 